Yeah. My man Zelakami over there. Yeah. Follow the gang. Zelakami, Takai Sinclair. Adios, amigo. There's a very mysterious character in the New York hip hop scene who goes by the name of Righteous P. He's so mysterious, in fact, that during his noisy interview, he requested that he have his face blurred. And so to this day, the identity of Righteous P remains a mystery. Well, at least to anybody who didn't watch his No Jumper interview a year before where he had his face out the whole time. Anyway, our old rainbow headed chum 6 9 and a young lad named Righteous P met in 2012 when Danny was still working at the bodega. It was a truly romantic meeting. P himself recounted working in the tattoo shop across the street and hearing 6 ix gravelly Hispanic voice shouting in the distance. I'm following it like a trail of Skittles into R. Kelly's basement. I was with, I was with my mans. Um, I worked across the street tattooing. I met him. I just heard like the cadence of his voice. Mm. I was like, damn, that, that's dope. I, like, I really jack, bro. Like, I liked him as a person, all that. Now, we learned in the previous episode of The Clout Chronicles that before rapping, 6 9 was running around getting attention by sporting offensive streetwear. And he only actually bothered starting rapping until somebody suggested that he put his wild, outrageous aesthetic to good use. Well, the man that told him to do that was Righteous P, and he would go on to become a manager-like figure in 6 9s early career. So I'm like, yo, you bro, you should rap. I mean, and we just put it together. So, P and 6 9 sparked up a friendship, but after encouraging 6 9 to rap, it turns out his whack bars just weren't cutting it. And let's not forget, these were way back in the days when 6 9 was rolling with the original Scum Gang, rapping like a contestant on The Voice Wu Tang edition. Now, initially, Righteous P began ghostwriting 6 9's verses, including that very first song that he released with a music video, 6 9. And I gotta say, he wasn't winning any Pulitzers for this writing, but fair enough. I guess all of Righteous Righteous P's creative juices were all used up after writing that squirrel line, so he enlisted the help of his younger brother Zilla Kami to help ghostwrite verses for the young 6 9 And this made perfect sense at the time because Zilla wanted to be a rapper, but he was too shy to appear on camera. Well, I wrote, I wrote a whole bunch of songs and I didn't like, I didn't, I was, was like looking at myself like, I'm not cool. Like, <laughs> you you know didn't have the saying? confidence yet? Yeah, it was just like, I'm not, I'm not for the camera. The lads knew immediately that 6 9 had star quality and their plan was to get him lit and then piggyback off his success right to the top. You know what it was? He wanted to be like a superstar and he had the star quality. So yeah, yeah. if you yeah. want to be a stu superstar, like, let's get this nigga lit. And then when he's Being lit, yeah, when he's lit, we did, we made like a chapter. So combine 6 9s newly recruited ghostwriter and manager with his longtime friend and ghost fashion designer, Scumbag Chad, who also occasionally wrote and rapped alongside 6 9 we begin to have an idea of his core team. And from there, that trio of ghosts begun to have a massive impact on the initial trilogy of 6 9 songs. That second song that he released called Pimpin was written by Zilla Kami. I mean, it makes sense. Surely 6 9 couldn't have come up with such deep lyrics himself. Although I actually believe it was William Shakespeare that first begun the trend of saying pussy stank rather than stinks. Othello, I believe. From there, the fourth song that he dropped, Shinigami featuring Bodega Bams, was written by Scumbag Chad. And on his fifth outing, the track Scum Life, which let's not forget was the first time 6 9 pulled in the help of the Scum Gang affiliated Crips in order to gain some additional gangster clout, had some extra vocals by Righteous P. But that Scum Life video was important for yet another reason. It was the first time that 6 9 would actually have a music video that was entirely shot and directed by Andrew Trife Drew Green. You see, 6 9 has got a funny way of making friends. Rather than just shaking hands, giving a compliment, or shape-shifting to human form from Lizard like I have to do to make friends, 6 9 likes to insult you on social media to get your attention. Think of it like negging, but instead of underhanded insults about the colour of that girl on Instagram's dress, it's more like shouting threats of gang violence. And I can tell you this approach, much like negging, doesn't really work on girls. You stupid bitch, you know you ain't shit and that's on blurred! What? Pull up, pussy! Pull up! But really though, do you want to want to grab some dinner with me sometime? Like, you know, it'd be real nice. Well, unlike the IG thotties that I don't have the confidence to pursue, 6 ix attempts actually worked. Because after some intense beefing with a mutual friend on Instagram, apparently Trife Drew actually ended up pulling up on 6 9 in person, but 6 9 eventually used his charm to disarm Trife Drew, befriend him, and eventually end up working with him on videos. Apparently Trife Drew had actually seen 6 9s earlier videos, and while he wasn't impressed by the visuals, he was definitely impressed with how much stuff he was able to finesse and put into those videos. And he would even go on later to write some music for 6 9 and launch his own musical career when shit hit the fan, even landing a feature on 6 9s ill-fated album Dummy Boy. So now 6 9s team is completed. We've got a manager, Righteous P, a ghostwriter and sidekick, Zilla Kami, a stylist slash guy that knows how to screen print HIV onto a set of shorts, scumbag Chad, and a videographer, Trife Drew. So this is the moment where 6 9s image really takes an overhaul and he begins to take his career to the next level. So, surely, nothing's gonna go wrong and they're all gonna stay friends, right? 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 
On May the 18th, 2015, Scumbag Chad announced 6 ix first ever project, the three-track EP 6 ix 9 Mixes. The second song on that album was named Inferno, I'm guessing named after the sensation you feel after sleeping with 6 ix 9 and the music video for that song featured extensive cameos from his team. Scumbag Chad is there, having a seizure in a lowrider. Righteous P is there, doing an elaborate handshake with 6 ix 9 Wow, it really took him a whole year to get his head around that scum gang handshake, didn't it? And my god, he keeps doing that handshake throughout the whole video. Honestly, by the time I got to the end of this video, I'd seen more skin on skin raw action than on Young Thug's tour bus. Honestly, I swear this guy's just racing around on a motorbike trying to shake as many unwashed hands in Bushwick, Brooklyn as he possibly can. You know what, it's got me thinking I might have to start my own official trap law handshake. Hey, give me that pound, blood. Give me that turtle. Flip, flip me a turtle, blood. Hey, give me that middle finger curl. Lock it in. Like, let go. Let anyway, this track Inferno was apparently written by 6 9 himself. And it's not surprising considering the fact that it's genuinely one of the worst and most uninspired songs he's ever put out. And that's saying something. Honestly, to me, the track Inferno really felt like a blip in the development of 6 9 But hey, maybe this was before his team really had a chance to sink their teeth in shaping his creative image. Because by the time he released his follow up track, Yoke, it was truly groundbreaking for a number of reasons. This was actually the debut of the rainbow haired 6 9 that had him out here looking like a mascot for an LGBTQ plus sports team. And this was frankly a genius exercise in getting attention. And it seemed like at this point 6 9 was literally willing to do anything to get more eyeballs on him. But beyond just making himself look like a My Little Pony that's been fed nothing but meth for 10 years, the track Yo K would be significant because it was the first time that he had publicly shared the mic with Zilla Kami. While P made it clear that he brought Zilla in to ghostwrite for 6 9 Zilla also made it clear that he'd made a habit of writing songs that featured back and forth segments designed designed for two rappers, himself and someone else, to go bar for bar with. I was writing songs where it should have been two people. Uh -huh. I would write like back and forth, so like I'd write like a four, that was like, and then I'd write a four in a different flow, and then a four, and then a four. And I like, would put it together, and I'd be like, this would be better if one person was talking gangster shit and then one person was talking cryptic shit and then gangster shit and like a back and forth. The track featured a pretty ingenious Grand Theft Auto inspired music video, Clout Theft Auto if you will. It had a GTA map and HUD with a constantly rising money counter, as well as the classic GTA busted graphic which I'm sure came in handy later on in his career. Only two things I'm scared of in life, mm -hmm. God first and the FBI. Anyway, in the song and music video, 6 ix 9 and Zilakami go back and forth bar for bar in a number of different settings, including the bodega where he used to sell heroin and out of the top of a speeding car. Now, I find listening to this song kind of ironic because since their falling out, while Zilakami has claimed to be the originator of this hardcore, shouty death rap style, on this song, it's really 6 ix 9 that has the more angry, screamy style of rapping, whereas Zilakami's verse on this song that he spits later is actually much more toned down and frankly unexciting. But hey, maybe this was a period when Zilakami was still just getting over his shyness and couldn't quite give it 100 like 6 9 could at this stage. Also, I've got to say, it's quite fun watching big bad Zilakami, who we all know from flexing with already discharged RPGs, trying to act tough with some plastic sticks at the Penny Arcade. Ooh, big bad man, Zilla, what are you gonna do? Beat me at Time Crisis? To be fair, there's nothing more hardcore than Dance Dance Revolution. I bet he plays on hard mode. Gang shit. Real talk though, Yo K was a fire song, a fire video, and it really reset the tone for 6 9 Zilakami, Righteous Pete, and Chad, proving that they had the creativity to really go places with their music. They followed Yo K up in August 2016 with the song Helsing Station. This was a legendary track and actually originally featured a breakdown by fellow local rapper and all-round scary dude So Smuller, who as we know would go on to be part of the group City Morgue with Zilakami and Righteous P following the breakup. And the track also originally featured an outro by Scumbag Chad, which also went uncredited and unincluded in the music video. This video featured a lot of anime cutaways and some highly irresponsible behaviour on an escalator. It was actually this moment that I truly knew that 6 9 was a genuine gangster, because I know that you'd probably get kicked in the back of the rainbow head for trying to pull this shit on the left side of an escalator in London. And 6 9 continued the trend of irresponsible and dangerous social disobedience later in the video by smoking a cigarette at a gas station. God, these guys are insane. I mean, what are they going to do for clout next? Drink bleach? Oh, never mind. I mean, one guy even lights a cigarette with an old-timey torch that you'd take to a lynching. Just cut it out, guys. There's nothing gangster about losing your eyebrows. Hell, at least Zilla lightened the mood with some very effeminate skipping. Now, the Yo K video was shot by Righteous P's preferred videographer, Cisco, while the Helsing Station video was shot by regular 69er, Trife Drew. But while Andrew filmed it, it was actually Righteous P that directed this video under the banner of his newly launched record label, Hikari Ultra, which represented yet another step for Righteous P taking ownership of 6 ix visual, style, and persona 
over this period. Righteous P and Zilakami actually claim to be the originators of this hardcore death metal rap style that 6 ix 9 popularized during this period. In an interview with China Mac, Zilakami and Righteous P made it clear that they felt this was a style that they were always repping and that they gave it to 6 ix 9 who popularized it. He was the face He's of what we were trying to push, but they didn't know like, damn, we were the people behind, we were like, the, the puppet master. And that was a style that they themselves then took all the way up to 11 after falling out with 6 9 and starting the hardcore group City Morgue with So Smoola and the beatmaker Thrax. They even reiterated that 6 9 really was a boom bap rapper before they started working with him. You wanted to be a boom bap guy. Oh, it's boom bap shit. Yeah, like super. <laughs> The 6 9 Zillakami, Sosmula, City Morgue, or whoever, sound is a pretty clear combination of punk, heavy metal, hardcore, and rap or trap all kind of mixed together. And although he himself really refuses to admit that P or Zilla helped him develop this style, at least 6 9 does admit that he was influenced by early rock bands. Years back when you first were getting into making music, what was influencing you? I'm guessing that it was kind of outside rap as well? Now, what influenced me, I listened to a lot of All That Remains, um, Parkway Drive, mm -hmm. like heavy metal. My brother was in like a band and shit. I mean, I personally always felt like throughout 6 ix 9s career, his style was more of a shouty SoundCloud interpretation of old necro death raps. But no one else ever seems to have clocked that. Crucifix you when I shoot the pistol and blow off your fucking head, only your body parts are superficial. And aside from the actual sound, let's not forget that at the time, hip hop had a pretty clear inclination in favor of rappers with colorful dyed hair. And we all know that Trippy Red was about to pop off with his maxi pad scalp vibes. Little Yachty had already set himself a part with his braidal beads ribbed for her pleasure. And Lil Pump's hair color seemed to have changed so many times over this period. I'm not sure if it's been dyed or just naturally changes with the season. Ah, the purple headed pump. That means there'll be a good kush harvest this year. Now, even though 6 9 has claimed plenty of ownership over his image, saying he himself had based the 6 9 character or persona around comic book supervillains due to a connection of how he saw his stepfather as a hero before he was killed. I wanna be like, a, I wanna be a villain. The villains never die. Superheroes always die. I'm a villain. Fuck being a superhero. I ain't trying to save shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to save nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm destroying anything that's in my way. But once again, it wouldn't take long for 6 9s claims over his image to fall into question. Again, after they all fell out, Zilakami proclaimed that the Takashi 6 9 character and persona was once again a creation of Righteous P. So look, whether or not you believe 6 9 came up with all of this stuff himself and these guys were just hangers on, or if you believe that Zilla, Chad, and P were the brains behind the operation, and 6 9 was just the beneficiary of their great creative ideas, regardless of who came up with it, we learnt previously from 6 9s falling out with Scum Gang that he has a long-running habit of getting in there with people who have something he wants, rinsing it for as much as he possibly can, and then spreading his wings and transcending that group of people to make his way solo to the next level of clouterdom. Now, 6 9 was taking his new persona, sound, and visual aesthetic forward into late 2016 with plans to drop a new project called Scum World Order on the 31st of October. He'd already previewed some songs from this project and supposedly he had created the entire thing with Zilakami, including one track that was listed called Sinaloa that was originally slated to feature both Zilakami and Sosmula together. However, before this project would be released, the guys would fall out and it would ultimately be scrapped. And the beef was truly confirmed when 6 9 removed Sosmula and Zilakami's verses from the track Sinaloa, then releasing it as a solo diss track directed towards his previous friends. He actually put together a video for the Sinaloa diss track with Trife Drew, which featured some delightful scenes of him hanging out in a junkyard and taking a bath in what looks like an upturned industrial fridge filled with dirty water and or urine. And he also spit some of his verse from a cage, apparently practicing for the later stages of his career. Wow, you seem to be doing really well after parting ways with your team, Takashi. But to be fair, he's not the only one that spent hours in the bath following a breakup. <laughs> Honestly, you can really see the loss of Zilakami and Righteous P's influence here. The bars are weak and he's pretty much just spouting his usual, I heard you're gonna do something to me, but you ain't done it yet, lines that he was spouting all the way to the jailhouse. This video has significantly less swag than the earlier Hakari Ultra ones with P's influence, and ironically, videos do tend to have a lot to do with their beat. Because there's basically four main reasons that 6 9 fell out with Zilakami, Righteous P and Scumbag Chat. Firstly, 6 9 took their video equipment and was apparently shooting videos for other people for money. Secondly, Zilla, amongst other people, fronted 6 9 bail money, which was never paid back. Thirdly, Righteous P was trying to sign a record deal for Hikari Ultra with the intentions of excluding 6 9 from the deal. And finally, 6 9 reused a beat for his song Zeta Zero, which Zilakami had already used. <laughs> 
So let's go through those in detail. 6ix9ine's got a weird relationship with videos. Many people have suggested that he always had an interest in video making, and budget Nas tribute act Dave East even claimed to have met him as a videographer before all of the clout. He was in the studio, he didn't have no tattoos, he didn't have no mm -hmm. colorful hair, he had a regular haircut. Mm. He sat in the corner. He's a cameraman, he used to do videos. Takashi was a cameraman. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. Now, making videos before the fame is something that 6ix9ine has always denied. Doesn't so, were you making videos for other people before you started rapping? Hell no. Oh, okay. <laughs> or hell oh. no. Oh, well, that's settled then. I'm sure there's absolutely no footage of him filming a. Ah, yeah, I am. Oh, no. Well, I'm sure there's no more evidence that he was really into video making early on. You know, nothing like him trying to convince Scum Gang in their first documented meeting that they should make a documentary. But you know what's the next move? Movies is, is the next shit. Y'all need me to start getting on a movie like Son, that. I just told you where you're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Documentary type shit, but like on some like first 48 shit. Ah, uh, yeah, there is that. And don't forget when he told DJ Self he was a video guy. Before I was rapping, we was, I was I was doing videos. And I was a video guy with my, with my friend Andrew. And there's also the fact that his early personal email address was actually legacyfilmsa7s2 at gmail.com. Obviously derived from the Sony a7s2 DSLR video camera, popular for shooting low budget indie music videos. So despite all of the rainbow color capping, it's pretty likely that 6ix9ine actually was running around making videos. So Zilakami, Righteous P, and the boys who were the creative video vision behind this operation were pissed when Takashi ran off from the video plug and took their equipment to go and shoot other people's videos for money. He took our camera equipment and tried to shoot other niggas videos for money and we like bro you can't do that we forgave him obviously you know what i'm saying that's a little shit so you heard it from zillow 6ix9ine was bugging out running off with a video kit but they forgave him on some brotherly love shit unfortunately next problem came in 2015 when 6ix9ine famously caught that charge for use of a child in a sexual performance now hold your horses i'm going to follow this video up with an entire video explaining the facts and circumstances of that case that 6ix9ine caught in great detail because i'm fairly certain that will get demonetized and i gotta isolate that fire content so that the youtube gods don't strike me down Seriously, it takes me a long time to make these videos. It really sucks when they get demonetized and it does happen. Anywho, just know, 6ix9ine got caught in a jam and he needed money to get bail. So Zillakami, P, and a number of people in 6ix9ine's circle pulled money and made contributions so that he could get out of jail. Like, basically, he went to jail, bailed him out. Now, apparently, the total figure of his bail was 75k which was reduced down from 100. And while the specific amount that Zilla and P actually contributed has never been disclosed, Trife Drew has suggested in a Rolling Stone interview that it's probably closer to two or $3,000, but apparently a lot of money to them at the time. But at a certain point, it seemed like Zilla Kami's patience had worn thin. So pissed off about the situation with the money and 6 ix other shady moves with their gear, he decided to man up, do the honorable thing, and take to social media to air out 6 ix dirty laundry in public, telling the world about 6 ix case and dropping shade on him for ruining the crew's momentum. We're like, yo, let's scream now. Oh, that's wavy. We keep that shit going. Bang, we start hitting niggas. Shinigami came out, all that real shit. We start getting a crazy buzz. And then now it's like, yo, we about to go on tour, you know what I'm saying? And he snaked us in the middle of that. He started, um, this nigga goes to jail for a rape charge. A minor. Well, in response, 6ix9ine predictably called out Pete and Zilla for being bitches, but also sidestepping any talk of the actual allegations. Yo, Zilla, you a bitch, and you know you a bitch. You came out of nowhere thinking you scum gang, nigga. The whole scum gang know. Scumbag Chad, I'm gonna let you breathe, bro. I'm gonna let you breathe because you've been my boy for mad long. Pete, you a bitch. Zilla, you a bitch. All y'all niggas is bitches. That's words to everything I love, bro. This kind of childish social media back and forth actually happened several times between these crews. And weirdly, apparently only moments before these social media outbursts, apparently 6ix9ine had been on the phone with P, speaking privately as if things were all good. He gets off the phone. Yo, I love you to death, bro. Like, all right, you feel me? Say that. I'm gonna call you again. I'm like, all right, bet. I get off the phone. I'm walking around my block just talking. To him. We used to talk every day like that. Um, Then I get off the phone and then nigga... Go to Instagram and just start dissing motherfuckers crazy. I'm like, damn, like. We just got off the fucking phone. I just with got you. off the phone yeah. with you, bro. Why are you going to Instagram when you and got my phone like, number? We're cool. Yo, you a pussy this, you a pussy that. Apparently, the realization about the duplicity of 6ix9ine's character was the final nail in the coffin between him and his former friends, and at that point, the beef was truly frying. And from there, 6ix9ine decided to spill the tea on a shady move made by Zilla and P. Apparently, they were planning to sign a deal with their Hikari Ultra label with Epic Records. And because they couldn't control 6ix9ine's moves or his erratic behavior, apparently, they had planned to cut him out of the deal, replacing him as the frontman of the group with Zilla Kami. They was gonna sign a deal with Epic, right? But they know they didn't have no control over me. So you know what they did? They said, yo, 
Once we once we get the little thing going on, we're gonna drop Takashi and we're gonna start fresh with Zilla. My manager, Righteous P, is, Z is Zilla's older brother. In return for this escalation of tensions, Zilla Kami took to Instagram, exposing 6ix9ine, telling the world that he'd written all of his songs, that Righteous P came up with his persona, and Chad came up with all of the ideas for his clothes. I mean, Zilla spilled the tea on everything. Apparently 6ix9ine doesn't even like anime, he's not really a blood or a crip, he doesn't sell drugs, and he doesn't even skateboard. Oh, what? Are you telling me it's all been a lie? Next you're gonna tell me he only does the missionary position. Zilla went on to clap back, saying that if 6ix9ine was stealing money, then how could they have trusted him in a label deal? Stealing money? How are we supposed to trust people? How are we supposed to trust you in a contract? What are we gonna do, you know what I'm saying? I'm writing your lyrics, bro. And this culminated in a not so dramatic moment where 6ix9ine supposedly confronted Zilla Kami outside of the tattoo shop, posting a snap suggesting that he had locked himself in scared. Zilla don't wanna come outside. That's Zilla right there. He don't wanna come outside. He don't wanna come outside. Yo, Zilla, come outside. No. He don't want to come outside, he locked himself in some type of tattoo shop. But Zilla disputed this on the No Jumper podcast, saying that he had come outside just after 6 9 finished filming. He tried to like post like a video of me like in the tattoo shop. It was like me literally two seconds before I walked out and he like cut the video before I walked out to make it seem like oh, I was like scared to come out. I'm gonna tell yo, you he that. said, I'm yo, the doors, that, he locked himself in and then opened the door and shut it real quick. I'm not sure about that, Zilla. Yeah, no, I'm not gonna go no, in the no, shop. No. Yo, come outside, bro. No, no let him come outside. outside. He, he, can come out, he can come outside on peace. Come outside. Whose moms is this? Following their bust up, this would leave 6ix9ine and Zilla's relationship irreparably damaged. But 6ix9ine and his former team would continue having that smoke from a distance. 6ix9ine continued releasing music, making videos, and his star continued to rise. In January 2017, he dropped the track Exodia, another music video starting with a cheerful sequence of somebody sitting there doing heroin next to him. The Exodia video also depicted 6ix9ine and Jay Stash going head to head against each other with bars, like some sort of lyrical Tekken or Street Fighter game, with the health bar dropping each time a hot bar was dropped. Once again, another technique that would come in handy later in his career. I mean, the Tekken idea is cool, but it's kind of already a little bit derivative of what he'd already done with GTA on that earlier video. I'm surprised he didn't combine these videos and follow this up with a new music video, inspired by Angry Birds, where he would toss used H needles at his enemies like some sort of op dartboard. Also, I just want to say for the record, a deep piece of trap lore here. In this video, he used a technique where you put a little bit of metal on your shoe, hang out of the car and drag it on the floor, creating this cool spark effect. Now, I've always loved this idea, but I want to make it clear that he stole this by fellow New York rapper and probably the most underrated man in the rap game who got completely snaked by the industry, Vinny Chase, who did it in the 2013 video for his song, Hustle. But that's not the only thing that 6ix9ine stole during this time. Scumlord Dizzy, the founder of the original Scum Gang, reiterated that 6ix9ine had indeed taken the crew's camera equipment to LA on numerous trips with videographer Trife Drew to film music videos, collaborations, and appear on the No Jumper podcast. He stole that camera that he had from the, the, um, the guy. I mean, he like, yo, I'm not fucking with them niggas um, no more. Like, the niggas try to play me, like, Rachel shot. He set up a meet and, and tried to have a contract in a label situation, like, right there for me. Like, I told him already, I'm not trying to sign, like, he already knew that. Now, one of the videos they filmed on these LA trips was the track Zeta Zero 0.5 which featured New York rapper and chicken tote bag thief Schlosser, Slavic rapper and frequent squatter Dali B, or Dalib, I'm not sure, and R. Kelly in the making famous Dex. Well, that actually wasn't a new track. See, the beat was produced by Thrax, the beatmaker who ultimately ended up joining the newly formed crew City Morgue with Zillakami and Sos Mula under Righteous P's management after 6ix9ine and the boys parted ways. Apparently Thrax gave that beat to 6ix9ine back when they were cool, but then was mad about the fact that the song came out after everybody had fallen out and Thrax had sided with Zilla. And because City Morgue had already used it on the track Yuck Mouth, Thrax ended up copyright striking 6ix9ine's video for Zeta Zero. And I don't know about you non-YouTubers, but for me, a copyright strike is a surefire way to become an instant op. So after this, by the time he'd made his way to his interview with Adam22 on No Jumper, 6ix9ine had all the smoke for Zilla and his former friends, saying that he bitched him. What happened with this Zilla dude? Because I had. I don't want to talk about that kid. I bitched him. If you want to watch the video, the videos on YouTube, I bitch Zilla. I bitch that nigga. He a bitch, like, you know what I mean? Like. And that Trife Drew and 6ix9ine were the true brains of the operation. I was the brains of that shit. Me and that kid right there, Trife Drew. Brains of everything. Dissing the boys for being unproductive and not having any videos since he left. They haven't put out a video since I left. Mm. They haven't put out no body of work, nothing. 
He also brought up the tattoo shop incident and seemed to refer to Sos Mula as a fake blood. I had to pull up on his, at his workplace, really bitch him, like him and that fake ass blood nigga he always with. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, niggas go to jail and turn blood. Um, I really had to run down on something. Like, someone was so scared. Like, bro, I had that nigga shaking, bro. Like, mm -hmm. real shit. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I certainly would not diss him. Sh shout out, shout out to Sos Mula one time. I like, I, you're a good, good guy. Don't kill your boy. Now, it's still unclear to me what exactly the specific beef between 6 ix 9 and Sos Mula was, but let's not forget that 6 ix later breakout song Gummo originally had a bar that was dissing Sos Mula that ultimately was taken out of the final version. Shout out Sos Mula, but I fuck that nigga, bitch! Now, during his No Jumper interview, 6 9 actually spent quite a lot of air trying to clear the air about Zilakami having told his fans that 6 9s charge was a rape charge, saying that if that really was the charge, then why did Zilakami even bail him out? You've run like a legal a uh, angle, yeah, and that's why angle. you wanted to show your, your name? Look me up. My name is Daniel Hernandez. D A N I E L space H E R N A N D E Z. And so he basically, did he say that you were messing around with underage girls or something? That's a fact. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And that wasn't true? That was not true, bro. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And if it was true and you bailed me out, you a bitch because who bails out a rapist? But also, for some reason, copping to having stolen the money and then not giving it back because apparently they're pussies for not having even tried to do anything to him. And you pussy for not getting your $20,000 back. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm not giving it back. 6 ix former friends, credit to them, tried to do the honourable thing and just get on with their careers. And while 6 9 is kind of right, their work rate certainly did slow down after the split. They at least stayed focused and tried not to let the beef with 6 9 define their entire careers. Over time, their newly formed crew, City Morgue, built up a legitimate buzz and they are now finally getting the opportunity to shine by themselves. But ultimately, there would be one final little-known showdown between these crews. Apparently, way back in late 2015, Scumbag Chad and Righteous P had actually trademarked the names Scumgang69 and Takashi 69. Hey, at least someone working at the patent office had a laugh the day that one got filed. Now, to me, it was no surprise they actually went ahead with doing this because it was the original Scum Gang founder, Scum Lord Dizzy, was constantly banging on about how important trademarking and ownership was. He don't have anything established. That's not even trademark. That's not LLC. We had Scum Gang LLC um, since 2011. Um, it trademarked in 2014. We got like two other LLCs with like society can't understand me. So this is perhaps why he begun to be known as 6 9 at this point rather than Takashi 6 9 But in October of 2018, 6 9 filed a petition of cancellation suggesting that 6 9 should automatically have the rights to use these trademark names because of how internationally recognized he already is under the name 6 9 And eventually coming out victorious, winning the rights to his name back in spite of P and Chad having spent years bragging about how they still own the rights to his name. And funnily enough, that decision came in 2019 while 6 9 was still locked up, likely making it the only pleasant 69ing experience that he'd experienced behind bars. And so that is the story of how Zilakami, Righteous P, and Scumbag Chad contributed a great deal to the growth, inception, and evolution of 6 9 before getting completely dubbed, snaked, and left in the dust. But one of the most important things to come out of this whole beef was that until they fell out, nobody had really distributed any information about 6 9s charges. And by uncovering 6 9s underage sex scandal, Zilakami left an enormous stink attached to 6 9s name that many people thought would be impossible for him to overcome. So in the next episode of The Clout Chronicles, we will be taking a much closer look at the allegations against 6 9 What actually went down? Was it as bad as people say? And how the hell did he manage to spin and finesse it in such a way that he was able to come out of this and have one of the biggest careers that hip hop had seen in the last decade? Didn't see you there. It's your boy Travel or Ross, just giving a humongous bath time shout out to my top tier patrons. Javier Gonzalez, Monique Vivret McKay, DJ Fred 100, Henrik, Henry Bryant, Josh Knappin, and of course, Niraj Shukla. Shout out the gang, gang. Appreciate y'all supporting. Anybody else that wants to support, head on over to patreon.com slash traplorrocks. Peace out, y'all.